Oh, hey. Welcome back, AP. That's right. Nice, easy morning. Going straight into this flip without going crazy. And we're going to start off by talking where we left off in class when we were talking about... Oh, whoop, whoop. He's getting excited again. Yeah, now we're going to uh, pick up right where we left off in class. We're going to start talking about art, right? So we were discussing in class talking about impressionism with Monet and post-impressionism using Van Gogh as an example. Talked about Fauvism right here, one with hat, which I'm not a fan of. But as you can see, what's happening before World War I is because this is the art trends that came before World War I. We're moving more towards what you would call abstraction or abstract forms of art. Things that kind of don't have a complete image of themselves or things that are kind of like slightly um, misconstrued in the image or allowing the interpreter or the interpretation of the viewer to connect imagery together. So that trend is going to continue post World War One, right? So this is World War One or pre World War One art, and then modern art is going to continue to advance post World War One. So this, for example, is a great example of Cubism. This is Pablo Picasso's Man with Guitar, all right? So, and as you can tell, it's pretty hard to see the man or the guitar, all right? But this is cubism, right? You can actually see elements of his face right there. You can see the guitar is actually located down here. Um, I actually like that one pretty well, um, personally. Now, that's what a cubist piece would look like. And of course, like... Picasso, just also so you know, had a, a lot of uh, art ventures before. Um, there is the old man with a guitar that is actually in my room, okay? It's the one that's hanging over my desk. It's, it's from his blue period. Uh, but, oh, whoa, whoa, that's too much. All right, so then you also have things like non-representational art. Okay, so now we're getting into this weird kind of dynamic when it comes to art. And we're getting into this moment where it's like, okay, one, it's one thing to be modern art and to have something like this and to have something that the interpreter can view and might want to like actually create the image on their own. But now we're getting into like this, which Mr. Waterson absolutely hates. All right, so once you get into U.S. history next year, you'll realize that Mr. Waterson absolutely despises modern art. Um, and we're also starting to see the origins of it in World War I, because even looking at this, at least this has imagery and color and connection and flow. It's almost like World War I caused a break in the psyche of Europeans, right? Especially in those who are actually going to be viewing art and actually imbibing with it. But World War I is going to see this just this disconnect, and you're going to see things just kind of get completely out of order. Non-representational art, this is a Kandinsky piece, uh, is just basically meant to not represent anything, right? It's just things that are just all over the place. Uh, it's not aiming for balance or flow. It's aiming for something a little bit more chaotic. Kind of like the society coming out of World War I following a war that no one could really wrap their minds around, right? And then you also have a form known as Dadaism, right? Now, Dadaism is my wife's personal favorite. Um, now, Dadaism is my wife's personal favorite to make fun of, actually. Now, Dadaism is like, it's anything, right? So, it's anything that's kind of over the top, uh, reversed, weird, out of sorts. Uh, so let's go da da is um, and it's kind of the best example of the destruction of the human psyche following World War One, right? Like here's another da da piece, which is actually like an iron with a bunch of nails attached to it. Here's another da da piece, which is like a collage and just a lot of stuff all over the place and the warped representation of reality. So da da is as you can tell is kind of the best representation of just the chaos and the absolute uh, just destruction that the minds and the souls and the hearts of Europeans had taken by World War I. And the most famous piece of Dadaism is this piece right here, which is an upside-down urinal by a man with the last name Mut, right? So, and as you can see, this was made in 1917. Now, going forward, though, is then you get back into your art where imagery is coming back around again, and you're going to see some surrealism, right? And, of course, this is Dali, Salvador Dali's Persistence of Memory. Surrealism is almost like the outside the real realm kind of art. It's, like, still got that disconnection with um, society, still has that disconnection with uh, the grappling of emotions from World War I, but uh, Salvador Dali is one of the best examples of realism or surrealism. And it's almost like all of his imagery and all of his ideas actually took place in like a dreamlike setting. Like, for example, like this is a tundra or a desert of a dreamland where he is 
just seeing all of these things happen. And this one, The Persistence of Memory, is his most famous piece. And this thing right here that everybody thinks is a horse is actually not. That's a human eye, that's an eyebrow, and that's a nose right there, okay? So, like, everybody also calls it the Melty Clocks. And ironically enough, there's on, on Causeway... There's a place called the TikTok Cafe that has a version of that on the side, but it's got like po'boys and eggs and cheese and uh, and bacon all over the place. I gotta take a picture of it and bring it to you. Um, but then there's another very uh, a big one. Geopolitics and Child is the one that's hanging up above my sign out sheets, right? So like that's a dolly piece as well. So the big thing about this that this is a subtle warning that you're not going to understand this is this is muted. That's actually not really for y'all. That's actually much more of a threat towards the other kids. Uh, that technology on top of everything else, is going to start making factories much more efficient. Um, so coming off the heels of the changes in art and the dramatic imp like influence in art that uh, World War I played a massive part in, uh, the economy of many nations is actually going to get a massive boost. Now, this is more connecting to uh, where the Roaring Twenties came from, right? Why was the econ economics of countries so much better after World War One. Well, the economy of many nations exploded, not Germany, uh, during the 20s, also not Italy, uh, due to the fact of the adoption of a lot of very intense new modes of ideas. For example, assembly line production, right? The assembly line and the production of uh, goods on an assembly line is going to be like put forward by Henry Ford and several other American entrepreneurs for things to be made in steps slowly as it gradually moves down the track. And the big thing about the assembly line production is it creates more products, produces them at a faster rate, and also makes them at a cheaper rate, right? The adoption full-fledged of the five-day work week by the end of World War I is going to help aid economies and actually lead to, wait, if we have a five-day work week, now we have a weekend, so we have leisure time, right? And studies have shown that post-World War I, with the adoption of assembly line production, the adoption of the five-day work week, and the adoption of weekends and leisure time, you actually saw the growth in economies, and you actually saw the growth in production, right? And so you had all of these different ideas. This right here, for example, is a group of people that are going off to a vacation. It looks like this is an American football team that actually is about to go practice. So as you can tell, these major adoptions post-World War I are going to be the big element that makes the Roaring Twenties so roaring, right? Science is even going to take a massive leap forward as well, pre- and post-World War I. So with World War I serving as kind of our marker, there are several people that came around before World War I, during World War I, and stayed relevant after World War I that were massive in the scientific community. And one of them is this woman right here, that is Marie Curie, right? So Marie Curie and her husband... Uh, are going to be very, very active in the scientific community for discovering the properties of, properties of radiation, radioactive decay, the radioactive nature of particles, and also discovered radium and actually uh, really, really did a lot of different studies on the, the kind of like dyingness of atoms. Because again, with Newtonian physics and energy uh, ideas, the idea that like atoms can't be like created or destroyed or matter can't be created or destroyed, Marie Curie's research along with her husband is going to show at least that matter might not be destroyed, but it definitely will change, right? And over time it can decay, it can wither away, and a lot of different elements like that. Then you're going to have Max Planck, right? Max Planck, a German physicist who actually discovered that subatomic energy, okay, like things like the energy emitted by atoms and other different particles is actually emitted in spurts, not in steady streams, which questions the relation of matter to energy. And it also re begins to start kind of putting in these ideas of quantum mechanics, right? And then, of course, you have the most famous scientist out of all of them. You have that of Albert Einstein. I don't even have his name on there because I don't feel like I even really need to put it on there, right? Everybody knows who Einstein is. But before World War I, he actually patented his theory of special relativity, right? When the relation of time and space are relative to the observer and the only constant in the universe is the speed of light. He also begins to discover the energy within atoms and the fact that the atom and particles themselves hold a massive amount of potential energy that are re ready to be released, right? And then also on top of that, you have some people like Ernest Rutherford, who realize that the atom can be split. Now, the interesting part about all these scientists and all of their amazing
amazing work going in from World War I, past World War I, are going to change the perceptions of even people's understanding of how matter, like how matter functions and lives, how matter emits energy, how we interpret time, and the fact that atoms can be split. Now, if you take all of these scientific advancements and all these scientists' ideas, Planck, Curie, Einstein, and Rutherford, and you merge them together, you'll notice that we're getting towards a pretty mind-blowing discovery if you understand what I'm saying, when it comes to this mushroom cloud, the splitting of atoms, the releasing of energy, and the creation of cataclysmic change, right? So we'll get more to this as a little bit of foreshadowing, but we'll get more to it when we get towards the end of this unit, right? Literature and philosophy is also going to make a dramatic change as well, and you're going to see the adoption of much more kind of dark intense literature post-World War One. Now, Mr. Roddy, I know, would love to explain a lot of this stuff to you, and if you have him next year, then he'll definitely explain all these things to you, but the stream of consciousness technique is a big one. So a lot of um, authors post-World War One are going to kind of just be forever shocked and destroyed from World War One, and you're going to see the adoption of this thing called the stream of consciousness technique. Now, Maria... How would you explain the stream of consciousness technique? Stream of consciousness? My wife is coming to help explain the stream of consciousness technique. Okay, sweetheart, so can you uh, explain stream of consciousness to them, please? Mm -hmm. So stream of consciousness is a writing style that would probably seem pretty chaotic to some people because it's just sort of on your ongoing thought. Ongoing thoughts. Where it's instead of telling a very clear story with a clear pattern, it's going to really just dive into like what the narrator is thinking and what they're navigating. And sometimes it's hard to read and you get lost and it's kind of like, wait, what did I just read? And you have to go back and read it again. But Virginia Woolf was a perfect example. Virginia Woolf, one Faulkner, of the authors I had to drop. William Faulkner, I got The Sound of the Fury um, right on here. And uh, Sh Chopin. James Joyce. James Joyce, there you um, go. Look Chopin. at this English major so we, go. So Kate Chopin and William Faulkner both wrote here in New Orleans different books. And Kate Chopin and William Faulkner both wrote different so books in New Orleans. Stream of Consciousness is sort of related to New Orleans because this is where a lot of them got their inspiration to write. We talked a little bit about that in class now. William Faulkner used to shoot nuns with a BB gun. That's right. All right, so now anyway, but thank you so much. Mrs. Terry for explaining that. I'm going to use one of my two degrees to help Yes, you. one of her two degrees. She has degrees in English and in dietetics. All right, so now, or nutrition, what, dietetics, dietetics, yes. Okay, making sure I'm saying that right. But like she just said, the stream of consciousness technique is this idea of the adoption of just the narrator's stream of constant thoughts, right? So in Ulysses by James Joyce, it's all about an Irishman on his way home from a bar in the middle of the night, and it actually mirrors the journey that Odysseus went on in the Odyssey, right? So, and then also The Sound and the Fury by Faulkner is a very famous stream of consciousness, consciousness technique piece, which actually in moments in the... Uh, in the, uh, in the novel, you're actually seeing the perception of reality through the eyes of someone with autism, right? So, and other different characters as, as well. And then you're going to see also some, like, dystopian, very dark, very, very aggressive forms of literature pop up. For example, Metamorphosis, which is by Franz Kafka, right? Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, uh, Mr. Roddy, very big fan. He explained the whole thing to me. And basically, in a nutshell, he said that this man basically turns into a bug and he is happier being an insect than leading the current life that he's leading because of the job and the life that he has is so awful that he would rather be an insect than keep living that life, right? So it's a very, very interesting dynamic when it comes to uh, the evolution of literature post-World War I. Then you also have the evolution of philosophy, which a lot of y'all already know about when you talked about nihilism and existentialism, right? So again, nihilism and existentialism, which are perfectly mirrored in The Great Gatsby, are actually really, really important because nihilism was first put forward by this guy, Friedrich Nietzsche, right? Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, is very, very famously quoted for his nihilistic theories as saying, God is dead and man has killed him, right? And nihilism, which is short for the Russian perspective of nihil, is means 
nothingness, right? Basically, he's saying that life is nothing, that we are all meaningless, that we are nothing is important, and that all of us are just specks of irrelevance traveling on a rock going through the universe at thousands of miles an hour. So why do we even need to worry about all these things? So nihilism can be both pessimistic and optimistic, but interestingly enough, nihilism is going to get a little bit twisted over time due to the fact that Friedrich Nietzsche is going to go insane in his later life after he sees a horse get slapped in the middle of the street, and he actually has a mental break break and then his sister ends up writing a lot of the stuff that she went to go visit him in the insane asylum and wrote a bunch of that stuff down and that he was saying and a lot of it was kind of racist and so some people thought I think it might have been like her terrible interpretations of society trying to say that it was him so she could actually have more legitimate power to like transpose these thoughts but anyway so nihilism is this nothingness right and then existentialism is an interesting one because basically it's saying that life and the existence around you are what you make it for it. For example, existence precedes essence, right? So you exist, but you need to make this essential and you need to make your life essential because once it's over, there's nothingness, right? So existentialism and nihilism are perfect reflections of World War I, post-World War I, right? And the big thing you need to understand too and so we've been talking about the Roaring Twenties. We talked about leisure time and factories and literature and science and all this other stuff. But the Roaring Twenties aren't really roaring for everyone. So even in the countries that are having massive amounts of progress, the Roaring Twenties could be considered very chaotic, tumultuous, and full of turmoil still, right? Because there's still massive lingering issues. Things like anti-Semitism. It did not go away. And as we get into World War II, you'll see it re-heightened back up and become much more intense. Growth of racism and racist ideologies, especially in places like the United States and also in Britain's still retained imperial colonies, right? Mm. Actually, during this time period, it is when the growth and the birth of Mohandas Gandhi and his works of Indian liberation from the British imperialists actually starts here. Violence against minorities when... During the 1920s, uh, lynchings and lynch mobs were at a massive height uh, inside the United States. This right here is the Tulsa race riot in 1921 that actually happened in July of 1921 where over 300 African Americans would be killed and their entire district in the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma would be completely destroyed. And also, you're going to see the adoption of this thing eugenics, right? Eugenics is this terrifying pseudoscience that came around. And what a pseudoscience is, it means a fake science, a science unfounded in research that is aimed at creating genetically superior races by excluding people who are judged to be inferior. Now, eugenics then becomes adopted by a lot of leading thoughts and a lot of leading figures, and they begin to adopt this concept of, oh, we can make society better by doing things like mass sterilizing people. Um, we can do this by executing or eliminating racial qualities we don't want. We can do this by uh, like specifically trying to like separate people with mental handicaps from the rest of society to prevent their spread of genetics. And this evidence is going to support racist activity, even though it's all completely false. And it's later on going to lead to things like the Holocaust and the exclusion of Jew Jewish populations in Europe. And also it served as like proof for people, proof quote unquote, for people who actually had racist ideologies in the United States as well. And then also when you're looking at World War I, you got to understand the true casualties of World War I. And that is the World War I veterans, okay? So they are a group that we oftentimes kind of ignore. And the World War I veterans are going to be just living a life that is nowhere near or nowhere even close to a representational thing of what they actually earned or did or sacrificed, right? So you're going to see the growth of this idea known as PTSD, and you're also gonna see a massive population of injured veterans in the millions, 23 million injured veterans that were actually gonna be created because of this war, and many of them had debilitating physical injuries, including blindness from mustard gas, including lost limbs from amputations and explosives, and then also including one of the biggest ones, and a disorder that at the time they called Shell shock, right? And shell shock is the earliest known cases of what is known as post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So actually mental incapabilities. And some of the uh, shell shock would be when like they would hear like a loud bang, like a pot or a pan, 
and they called it shell shock because it could be triggered by a loud noise, much like the artillery shells that were going off during World War I. Now, uh, also a big thing is like some of these shell shock cases would render the person catatonic, like they couldn't actually move or they couldn't function, and it led to a very hard life and a very miserable life for a lot of these veterans. Now, I do think it's important to know and to note that there are some people out there that tried to help and aid the veterans post-World War I, and one of them is a woman who is amazing to me, and her name is Anna Coleman Ladd. And Anna Coleman Ladd actually adopted onto herself the job of creating prosthesis and prosthetics for injured World War I veterans so they could exist in society like a normal person. For example, this person right here, this French soldier, had the front part of his face destroyed by a grenade, and she made this prosthetic mask for him so he could exist in society, and it looked like his old photographs. And this right here is Anna Coleman Ladd actually helping fit his mask and make his prosthetics. And it wasn't even just stopped there. She helped make fake, not fake, but prosthetic arms, legs, uh, different uh, hands and things like that to try and help these veterans. And it's amazing work that she did. Now, many of these veterans are going to attempt to re-enter the post-industrial economy. However, many couldn't write and, or let's go, excuse me. However, many couldn't and women are going to end up replacing them in these factories. And the terrifying thing about it is, even though some economies boomed in the big three areas, Great Britain, France, and other areas like that, you're going to see the fact that 23 million men were left behind, which is a terrifying aspect of war and their true casualties, right? So going forward, though, you're also going to see this idea that booming economies are only truly valid if you're one of the big three countries, right? If you're a big three country and you are actually created this state where your economy is exploding, then yeah, your 20s are roaring. But not if you're one of the losers or one of the most affected, okay? So if you look at some of the places like Italy and Germany being the worst of the two, Austria, Turkey, and other areas of the like, you're going to see the fact that their economies are not booming. Their economies are floundering, right? So... Problems in these areas included hyperinflation, which is the hyper demon or the hyper deregulation and demonetization of currency. You're also going to see massively high employment, unemployment, failing businesses, a concept that I refer to as fractured masculinity, which we will get further into later on, which is going to help lead to some of the enrollment in these Nazi programs and fascist programs as well. And so you've got a huge amount of issues. This right here, for example, in the 1920s, is a man going to pay for a loaf of bread that costs over 2 million Deutsche Marks, right? Because the government began to just print money as fast as possible. These are children playing with stacks of money in the street as a toy or as a building block because they're worthless, right? That right there are German children playing with Deutsche Marks as well. And this and these problems right here are going to sow the seeds of what is known as totalitarianism, right? Which is one of my favorite history terms on the planet, okay? So totalitarianism and what it is is what we're now getting into. Totalitarianism, notice we're not saying that it has been created yet, but these are the seeds of it, right? Totalitarian governments are going to take control and take over societies that have been destroyed by World War I, not your roaring societies, but your destroyed societies. So Germany, Italy, Russia become places that totalitarian governments can rise up, right? Now, a government that seeks total control over the lives of its citizens through the use of centralized dictatorship is a totalitarian government, okay? So when you're looking at this, you've got two types of totalitarian governments that are going to begin to rise up in the 1920s. And those people are fascist totalitarians hiding behind the ideas of socialism, even though they're not socialists at all. And we'll talk more about that when we actually get in class and stuff like that. So you've got that, which is one thing. And just to give you a heads up of what fascism is, or fascists, it is this idea of a far-right, ultra-nationalist movement characterized by forcible suppression of the opposition and a strict obedience to the state. 
So take basically the political spectrum and going all the way to the left and becoming socialist. Now there's this weird creepy area where you come back around and you're almost about to come back to the right and become super conservative again. Fascism exists in that backdoor space, right? Where the government is heavily involved in the lives of the citizens, but they're doing this and they're cornering off people, encouraging violence, encouraging forcible suppression, and encourage, encouraging the exclusion of people that they deem to not be appropriate or good enough for their society. So with this element, you've got the growth of several different fascist dictators that are going to rise up. And where this word comes from is the Roman symbol for fascism known as the fascist, the fascist right? This actually is was invented first by this guy, named Benito Mussolini, who created the Italian Fascist Party and is deemed the creator of the word fascism and also of fascist dictatorships, right? And then also your secondary one, you have Hitler, Adolf Hitler, and the Nazis, or the National Socialist Party, which they're not actually socialist whatsoever. I'm going to cover up that stupid image with a rainbow just to make him feel stupid, and I'm going to put a little teardrop on his face and next because I hate his guts. All right, so now, then you have communist dictatorships, right? Or your ultra-socialist dictatorship, which is also kind of flirting with this whole fascism understanding. And that's going to rise up because the communization, as you, or communism, as you know, is the collectivization of the means of production, the prevention of economic elites. You know what this is already. You don't have to write that down. But the big communist dictator we will discuss, or the communist totalitarian, is Joseph Stalin, right? Now, the big question you also have to ask is, why then? Why these guys? Why are they the ones that have become this like fascist dictator? Why did Mussolini rise up? Why did Hitler rise up? Well, we're going to get into that right now, and it's going to be the last thing we talk about in this flip, okay? So the thing you have to understand, uh, or that you really need to understand, is that Mussolini has an entire early life that preceded his rise as a totalitarian dictator, okay? And these things include the fact that he actually was born to a very, very, very smart couple, raised mostly by his mother, who was a teacher. So later in life, he became a teacher himself and ended up becoming an elementary school headmaster, right? He then became a draft dodger and he actually ran away to Switzerland and spent some years in exile there because he refused to serve in the military, in the Italian military, until he was later arrested when he then returned to Italy to try and like spread some of his socialist ideas, his so socialist ideas, which were actually much more fascist. And after his arrest, he would serve in World War I, and upon being released from World War I service, he would then go off and begin to write in newspapers, right? And as his articles grew and as his writings grew, the big thing that would happen is he would use this to recruit people who were furious, right? He began to recruit young, disenfranchised, economically destroyed and emasculated young men, right? So, and he began to recruit them into a militia force known as his black shirts, right? And his black shirts, literally, after he spent years recruiting them, straight up marched on Italy in 1922 with his black shirt army, and they took over the Italian government and forced the Italian government to appoint him prime minister. And this is actually him with his black shirt recruits, as you can see, most of them young men, showing up and just taking over the Italian government. It is disgusting how fragile the Italian government was after World War I and the fact that somebody like Benito Mussolini was so easy for him to come in and take over. Now, then you also have Adolf Hitler, right? Now, Adolf Hitler has a very, very similar kind of rise to power as Mussolini. They're also kind of creepy because they're almost the exact same, even though, ironically enough, Hitler and Mussolini hated each other's guts. Now, anyway, but the big thing, though, is that Hitler started out as an artist and a vegetarian. He actually applied to art school multiple times. He was born in Austria, not born in Germany, interestingly enough, but... He's going to grow up in a very, very single-parent family household with his father, and he's going to have, from what we understand, some traumatic experiences at a young age. Now, he is then going to, like, join World War I as a soldier. He is going to be captured as a POW at one point, and then he also is going to begin to kind of form his ideas inside of World War I. As we know, he was a little scumbag, and he didn't want to do the Christmas truce because he was... Bleh. But anyway, whatever. Now, he then becomes an organizer in the, na the National Socialist Democratic Labor Party 
of Germany, which are going to then be later on shortened into the term Nazi, right? So National Socialists, even though they're not socialists. I don't know how many times I have to put this thing forward. Then he is going to try a failed coup. He attempts a black shirt march whenever he actually is living in a place called Munich. And Munich is in southern Germany in Bavaria, right? And he begins to try and recruit his own force, and his is going to be called the Brown Shirts, right? And the Brown Shirts try to have a coup known as the Beer Hall Pooch, where they basically try to organize young men in beer halls to lift up guns and take over the government in Munich. But what's going to happen is his, fair, his failed beer hall pooch, which you need to actually highlight, he's going to then be arrested. And while he's in prison, he begins to write. Now, in prison, he writes most of his book, his famous book, and he addresses it to his uh, then partner, who would later actually dis like disassociate himself with him, named by the name of Eric Ludendorff. And he writes this book known as Mein Kampf, right, which was then going to be published in 1925 and it sold millions of copies the year it was published and inside that book he advocated for his the, his theories of Liebenstrom which we will talk about later the Volksgemeinschaft which we'll talk about later the idea of a Führer or a leader leading a, a national movement in Germany and also of racial purity he then proceeded to grow a massive following and recruited even more members to his furious middle lower class militia of nothing but fractured emasculated young men known as the brown shirts and he would then later use those brown shirts to begin to a parade of a violent attacks on people inside of germany including communists and jewish people but we will talk more about this in class we'll talk about his rise to power and we'll discuss many other things but i'll see y'all then y'all have a good one